Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on a Friday, TGIF. Uh, my name is Joaquin, and I'm the host. Um, with me today is Matias. Says, says, boo. Nice one. That's, okay. that's getting better. Matias is going to beat me up if I keep messing up his name. So, uh, Matias, how are you? I'm pretty good. I mean, it's almost vacation, so I'm good. Definitely good. Where are you going to go for vacation? Oh, family and Lyon. I live in France, so I would move to Lyon to eat a lot of food for sure. What about you, Joaquin? How are you? I'm a simple guy. I'm just going to stay home with uh, my girlfriend's family and we'll have a lovely dinner and dance, probably. A lot of dancing. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, getting okay. away from the tango. Uh, Tell me a little bit about your PAC journey and uh, where you're at now. Okay, so um, I started a PhD like now three years ago. So it means that I, I should complete it pretty soon. So I'm, I'm in, a, in the stress, stressful part where I get a rush and write down the, the manuscript. Um, the PhD, I, I've, I've been doing it with a company, so a company named Trespass. And I'm working on um, this company as a search engine, on um, a search engine to to look for 3D components of industrial industrial component like screws, bolts, and actually there is various stuff, a pump. Anyway, and I'm the goal of the PhD is to enhance this search engine by bringing in some um, domain knowledge, expert knowledge into the search engine. So I ended up working with knowledge graph, well, ontologies, then knowledge graph, how it fits together. And in, initially, you had started your uh, academic journey in the sciences, in the hard sciences, right? And then you found some way that kind of turned you to the power of of knowledge representation and knowledge modeling. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? So if I do the the entire path. Uh, so I did high school in France. <laughs> I I was uh, doing a lot of sport at the time. So I ended up in a school just because um, what is called an engineering school in France. So that would be university for the US. Um, and uh, so I ended up there for sport mostly to do, to do, I was doing judo. And then I took the, the computer science department and during my internships, I ended up um, uh, discovering what are ontologies and ontologies in the semantic web sense. So working with RDF, with OWL, with um, RDFS, so all those semantic web languages. And, you know, one internship from the other, I ended up uh, at uh, my, the same, the lab in, in my school, actually. Uh, one of my teacher proposed me uh, this PhD, so I took the opportunity. And now that you're in the painful part of your uh, PhD journey, um, what is it? What what is the area of focus that you're looking to write and communicate and defend your your dissertation on? So one of the one of the main thing I want to do is uh, I. It took me a while to understand ontologies and even more knowledge graph. And I would say that the notion of knowledge graph is kind of in the hype, like at the top of the hype curve right now. And the, so the definition of what is exactly a knowledge graph from a, a theoretical, but also from a practi practical point of view is kind of fuzzy for me. Well, it was kind of fuzzy. So I, I created a, a definition of what is a knowledge graph. Well, not created, I adapted, adapted everything that I saw and to come up with something that was clear to me. And so that's what I want to present uh, for, for my, um, my defense and also how to use it in the context of information retrieval. So yeah, that's, it's still a work in progress though, you know, clarifying all the ideas and putting that into text, meaningful words. Um, in the previous uh, conversation we had in the podcast, we wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, framework, the OLAF framework. 
ontology. Mm -hmm. What what does the acronym stand for? So along the so during the three years, uh, I ended up. Okay, so if I bit a, let me give a bit of context. The the data that I'm working with, um, it's three D components, but also the description of so the textual description of the three D components, and uh, the three D models. And so I decided to not focus on the 3D file, but on the text. So it means that I wanted to build a, a model, a, um, a domain knowledge, um, a representation of the domain knowledge um, based on the text, which requires a lot of uh, natural language processing. Yeah. And, and just to paint a clear picture, it's a uh, trace parts is a marketplace that hosts uh, like specifications from manufacturing suppliers and things like that? Um, so I wouldn't say they are a marketplace because they don't sell the product, but the, um, they are um, a digital marketing company. Mm -hmm. So they do the advertisement for companies. So companies like, let's say, Schneider Electric, SKF, they're gonna they pay trespass to put their catalog well, among other things, to put their catalog um, on trustparts.com. So you you so then the idea is that as an engineer, when you're doing you're building a machine, whatever you gotta model it, and instead of uh, you know redoing the existing stuff like redoing a pump or spending time on redoing the screws, the bolts, whatever, you can go on the website, find the the three D model who you're looking for, download it. Add it to your, um, add it to your overall 3D model, and um, and of course when you do that, you also download the the metadata, where if you have downloaded something from say SKF, then in the metadata it's really an SKF. So it, when it comes to I believe the term is sourcing, you know when when the model is finished and you gotta buy the products to actually build the machine then technically we hope the, the the company names is within the model so that's how it works but the thing is um first one of the main issues is that there is a lot of languages i think there is 25 languages on the website so it mm -hmm. does it doesn't mean that all the components have 25 languages but it means that you can find any of those languages so it also means that when you design the, the search engine, you got to think about the the, the domain knowledge, the technicity, but you also have to think, oh, they're going to be not only English or not only French, they're going to be potentially any language. So right now it's based on text, purely text. So it means that you do string matching between the user query and the text, the, the descriptions. So it means that if I write in Chinese, for instance, I will never match anything in English hmm. and vice versa. So the, the idea is to move from raw text to concept, meaning if I write a, if I, I'm looking for screw on the website, my user query is a screw, whether I write it like this in French or screw in English, and I don't have the other names, what is still a screw? So if, if I, do this translation right at the beginning and I then use the concept to search the co the document uh, to search the 3d model then i i have kind of abstracted the the, the language issue hmm. though to be fair to be fair it's kind of just shifting the the problem the problem was directly in the database right now and i'm shifting it to the pre-processing step because we still need to match the string with the concept. So, but that further makes it easy for you to separate concerns in different aspects. So it's it's a good thing, no? Yeah, it's definitely a good thing. So the the little experiment I did um, at the company shows that. Well, first of all, when you moved from the string to the concept, you're kind of reducing the search space because language is like a huge, all the words, all the possible words is like a huge, um, it makes up a huge uh, search space. Even more if you add up all the spelling mistakes and whatever, it creates any number of tokens. 
if you do this pre-processing to resolve a string to a concept, then you already entering uh, a smaller search space and a more structured one. So that's the the idea. And the idea, this idea is definitely not new. That's something that is done for a while. I mean, in indexing based on concept in the academic research at least it's not new. It's like maybe the, the two two thousand they started to do that. So so we were going to go into Olaf, and you were laying the contact. Oh yeah, see, we're starting to go <laughs> everywhere. So okay, so the main point in that is I'm working with text, and I need to build a. I don't have access to subject matter expert, but I still need to build a, a domain or a, a domain knowledge representation. And so my my base, the my source of knowledge is this set of texts. So OLAF is stand for Ontology Learning Applied Framework. Ontology learning is a is a field of research where we're trying to automatically from the data create an ontology, meaning a, a knowledge representation. And by representation, I mean a knowledge representation so that the computer can understand it and use it. So OLAF is focusing on ontology learning from text and this project ended up being a set of tools. So what, what we, I'm, I'm saying we because I'm working with an, a, a colleague. She has another subject, but we have the same issue that we need to build an ontology from text. So we we are working together and we are building this uh, Python library where essentially when we, we were doing the state of the art, the literature, the literature, I can't pronounce that one. Literature, literature. No, okay. The no, state of the art. Yeah. Okay, literature review on uh, ontology learning. It turns out that you have bits and pieces everywhere, and it's an entire pipeline, you know, with different tasks put in a row that forms the ontology learning stuff. And papers were focusing on some tasks called you know three tasks two tasks and just mixing them together and we thought that we could implement those into a toolbox so then you can build your own pipeline and experiment but in the end the pipeline is you input a corpus of text and you get um, a knowledge representation and the knowledge representation can come in any language you want we have an object it results in the in Olaf, it results into an object where you have concept relations and we have meta relation, but then you can decide to serialize that in whatever language, let's say OWL, for instance. But you could do that. You could export that into I don't know, a neo for and and a, a neo 4 graph or whatever. it's based on standards and then it, from there it could be transcribed into anything that is yeah. like proprietary vendor specific right mm -hmm. definitely so that's the idea and the, the the little piece we are adding up right now is so once you have created your your knowledge graph out of that um the other component that is missing is the what we call an entity linking so the task of entity linking is that you, you have a knowledge graph, you have a bunch of text, and you want to automatically recognize the entities of your knowledge graph in the text. And we thought, OK, we create a, a knowledge graph, but we want to use it by tagging stuff in our text. So why not automatically also create the, the, the minimal version of the, of the entity linking system? I don't know if that's clear. How does that work? It creates, in the end, it's not yet done, but the goal in the end is to have an entire end-to-end -end pipeline where you start from your text. So you input your text to the OLAF. So OLAF, in OLAF, you build a, a pipeline. This pipeline, it takes your text output uh, knowledge representation. So essentially it outputs your knowledge graph. And then you give your knowledge graph to this other project that we name, we call Buzz EL, so to do the entity linking. 
and Bezier takes your knowledge graph and outputs a system that we call an entity linker. And this entity linker is taking text as input and tagging in your text on entities. Okay. Like if, if okay. you have a, you're speaking about the president, it's going to say, oh, I've got a, Mr. Macron is the French president. If you, if it's an article about you have Mr. Macron in your knowledge graph, it's going to tag it in your text and say, oh, this piece of text, it's about Mr. Macron. And at the same time, is it also finding relationships between concepts that are found in proximity to each other in the same sentence? So that's in Olaf. In Olaf, that's part of the thing. We could detail, but it, it would be like very long. But the, okay. the ontology learning pipeline is like a lot of steps. And one of those steps is what we call relation extraction. And it's, it, it is essentially doing what you're mentioning. You know, you, you're finding concepts, and then in the text, you can find relations between those concepts. Okay. I'm going to just put um, the, you know, we're, we're open to taking questions. Feel free to jump in whenever you want. Um, and with this uh, Olaf, Buzz Lightyear uh, combination, um, where is this going to be implemented in the future? What 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 sort of use cases do you foresee would be an appropriate place to deploy a solution like this? Um, well, let's first say that's a research project. So before going from research to production is like something completely different. So there is no product. But the, the global idea is at some point we should be able to throw a bunch of text, say, put a, a textbook about, let's say you're learning economic science, economy, you know, whatever. When you're learning, um, yeah, economic science, you put your textbook uh, as input to Olaf, it gets you a knowledge representation, a knowledge graph about your book. But now you want to use this knowledge graph to tag the concept of this knowledge graph in the newspapers that you have. And you should be able to do that. The minimal, the minimal um, product. Uh, I don't. Know. I'm mixing that up because the goal of Olaf is to build what I I like to call a minimal viable ontology. It's not going to be an ontology, a perfect ontology. Right. But the 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 research question we are trying to solve here is. Can we entirely automate the process to build a minimum ontology that is messy, but that is still useful for the downstream downstream down downstream task? So this is a tooling that you shove in a textbook, and the textbook mm -hmm. has all these interrelated concepts, all these definitions. It instructs somebody on a particular subject matter do domain. Um, mm -hmm. This thing strips out the meaning of each concept that it deems to be valuable, finds relationships with associated concepts, mm -hmm. and it builds this messy and kind of unstructured knowledge graph that then you would go and see in a open, open standard that you can inspect and go and fix a little bit better with the assistance of a subject matter expert, or maybe for the specific uh, domain application that you're looking to do, right? You're, you're not going to go crazy with it, but it's going to help you save a bunch of work just putting all that into a knowledge graph to start. So the, the in, in knowledge graph project or ontology project, one of the main issue is that it's a very hard task. You, you, you got to invest a lot of time and resources to manually build knowledge. So there is a bunch of tools that tries to help in this process to make it faster. And ontology learning is one of those. And one of the, when we did the state of the art, what, what we found is that most of those ontology learning tools, they are focused on helping the ontologist or the knowledge graph builder, not uh, creating a knowledge graph, but actually helping it, you know, like, building a user interface where it proposes you some concepts and it proposes you some relation and then there is a human validation for all the stuff. And we thought that is interesting, but what we would love to have is really the automate all this process. 
So that's what we, we are trying to do. But then the knowledge graph is a living thing. It evolves a long time. So we want to we want to create automatically create version zero. And then you can iterate on top of that afterwards. But the goal is that version zero is or is already useful. So we're talking about this knowledge graph concept, and it's a sort of um, a nebulous thing, and many people de uh, define it in different ways. Can you talk a little bit more about your description of a knowledge graph? Mm -hmm. I, I um, a fabulous one. What is hard is having no, you know, usually I have a diagram. It's easy to put. Um, so one of the hard thing when working with knowledge graph is there is two things. This is a large space. Knowledge graph is essentially a graph, so you can do many different things. So it means that a lot of different communities are using it because knowledge graph is actually the tool. It's not, it's not the process, it's really the tool. Um, and then there is ontology and which is, I would say an older uh, space, but it's another community. And I feel like they are both merging right now. And this merging of communities, it creates different words to say the same thing or similar words to say different things. So when you are trying to learn about knowledge graph and ontologies and all the stuff, you end up, you know, with many, many, many different words and you're kind of lost. Um, and there is no precise definition. And even it's even harder to find a practical definition. You know, something, you have the theoretical definition, but applying an example on this, you know, an example usage, a practical thing is it's harder. So I ended up finding the, I think it's called the Knowledge Graph book. It's a book, it's 2019. It's like many researchers that worked on that. And they try to really define what is a knowledge graph. And so I essentially started from there and try and try to apply my own understanding of this. And in those, one of the key thing is they really tell you there is three different things. There is the 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 graph structure that you're using, the 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 graph um, data structure. Yeah. Yeah, the graph data structure. So how there you will see typically you will see label property graph and edge label graph, edge label directed edge label graph, which is let's say RDF is an implementation of that. But you gotta really make the distinction between the data structure you're using, the knowledge you're trying to represent. And the third thing was, oh, I'm getting lost. Domain, no. Oh. Well, that's another part. What once you have that, you gotta make the distinction between your data and your knowledge representation. Everything can be a graph, especially if you're working with semantic web technologies. You're working with RDF, whether it's the domain, the knowledge that you're describing, or your data. It's all a graph, and. So you got to make the distinction between what they call the domain graph and the data graph. Uh, and that's that's kind of hard to visualize. It took, at least, I don't know if it's hard, but it took me a while to understand. So, and I'm not even sure I'm understanding fully right now. But I focus on semantic web, so I'm using RDF. And I'm, I think I ended up having an example where I can show with RDF file. You know, this RDF file is the data graph. And then this RDF file is the domain graph. And you need to have a mapping between both graphs, otherwise they live together separately and they don't talk to each other. What you want is really apply your knowledge to the to the data. And so you need this mapping. So I can show show you right now because it's on a GitHub, but uh, I've got you this could, example. You could share your screen if you'd like, um, but uh, I'm I'm not sure I want to go down that path. I don't think I'm ready to really explain it. That's <laughs> in the process, but but essentially the idea is that I, I'm 
I'm doing applied research. So it means that I'm trying to understand the theory and apply it. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the things I want to put in my manuscript is really, here's the theoretical definition. Here's how I apply it. Like you can, I can tell you this RDF file, it's the domain graph. This RDF file is the data graph. This RDF file is doing the mapping between both graphs. Now let's load everything in the triple store and let's see if the reason or what does happen. I mean, that's just a beautiful description of here's the data, here's the domain, and here's how they're related. Because uh, a lot of organizations and their existing systems, they have schemas in their database. And that's sort of a, a rough representation of a da of data mapping, of, of how they uh, organize and think about their systems in a digitized way. Um, mm -hmm. And if, they're, if they have a layer above that to make sense of that, they have the data catalog, right? That's something that's above the schema to make sense of how different databases have relationships um, and, and they re represent the same entity across the system, a distributed system across different um, database systems. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're describing, okay, that sits here in one side. And the other side, you also have to, look at it from the brain, from the perspective of the people that work in the organization. And that's the knowledge representation where they say, we, we, we farm apples, apples grow on trees. We pluck, we pluck apples on October. We package the apples and make apple sauce. but there's all those process that happens in between. And that's what you see in the transactions that happen in the database. So I think it's really cool that you make an, you make an emphasis to say that there's, there has to be an integration between the knowledge and the data. And the, so you, you're touching on the, the hardest point here is to the domain graph, you apply the domain graph on the data. So you apply your, your knowledge on the data. So it also means that you can, you can apply, apply. If you can apply different, I got an echo, I don't know why. You can apply different knowledge on the same data so you, you can imagine a system where you're looking about uh, on the data about your apples and your trees and the transaction and the, the states how it transform and different application can apply different knowledge on the same data and it won't result in the same uh, reasoning in the same inferences it's from a human perspective, it means I'm applying my point of view on this data, and you can apply yours. And to, to maybe I switch. I no, it's being... good. It's good. You, a person can apply their perspective on a, on the data based on the schema in their head yep. the schema that they built on experience, on knowledge of that system, uh, the the human like practical system where we engage. But um, yeah, we also take into consideration the weather. We got to go check weather, weather channel or weather.com. We check our phones, mm -hmm. the weather. That is human knowledge of the world that also applies to this system. And we can easily integrate an API that says what the weather is going to be like for that day and how that's going to affect. Um, so if we, if we take the example of the, the weather, imagine different weather application that gives different results, but they are looking at the same data. Maybe they are using actually the same uh, sensors to get, so they get the same signal that is the data, but they are applying different point of view because they have their own way of interpreting the data. Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin, like different For, Yeah. For instance, you might have your knowledge and your knowledge use Fahrenheit. So when you apply, you won't have the same number than my knowledge about Celsius. So, and I, I think we can apply that in, a, in an information system. You know, different application leverage the same data, that's, but that's, they have the different domain knowledge. That's the beautiful thing about what you were saying of shifting the problem from the data to a conceptual level, because then, yeah, you speak French. I, I don't speak French. I speak I speak Spanish. So mm -hmm. um, 
if I want to interact with a database or a system and I want to do it in Spanish and you want to do it in French, we shouldn't have a mo monolingual system to handle our interactions. Like we have English, we have Spanish, we have French. We should be able to engage with that same system without having to rebuild it again. And the, the different French code or Spanish code, it's, it's ridiculous. It, it's, I think they do the, I'm not a software engineer, but I think they, I don't remember the name of this framework, but the, the idea is that the system should stay the same. And what you need is just to build the adapter. Mm. So the translator between your input, your new input and the system. But once you have this translation made, you can just use the system. So I'm, I'm going to diverge here, but I, one of the other ideas that I really like is with those uh, knowledge graph is that you're pushing the domain knowledge in the data. In practice, often what you do is that a lot of your domain knowledge is hidden in code. You know, when you create a, a logic in code, it's domain knowledge that you're actually not putting in the data, but keeping in the code. And I believe you can, a lot of this um, domain knowledge can be in the data. That's what makes um, a triple store with data intelligent. So. Context. Context. Yeah, you're bringing context. Yeah, yeah. But the, that's context that usually is, I, I'm going to try to make up the example that I'm implementing right now. Um, imagine uh, I'm building a faceted, do you know what is a faceted search or a ca classification browsing? Okay. You're blowing I want to, with these uh, I wanna, technologies. Uh, no, no, no. W w when you go on a website and you're looking for something, you can go through a classification. You know, go down trees. You know, I want a screw. I want it to be red. I want it to have a, a, a you know, go Wait. on a, whatever, go on Airbnb. They're going to propose you with, do you want an apartment or a house? Does it need to have, and you click, 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 and you. Yeah, when you're saying that, I'm just thinking of a com compound like query, right? Like a complex query chain with different preferences. Mm -hmm. So the, but, one interesting thing is that if if you click on an apartment, maybe the the swimming pool option won't be available anymore because you have selected an apartment and not a house. So you have all this interdependency between the categories you're selecting. And you can implement that in code. You know, you have your structure and you say, if this is is selected, then you cannot have that anymore. But if that is selected, you have that, and you can do a, a program to implement that. And what I'm trying to do right now is to implement that in OWL. So you put a lot of things that you, you would have put in the code, a lot of the logic of the system that you would have put in the code, you put it in OWL, in the ontology itself, in your knowledge graph. and and you will end up with having a piece of code that is only asking two things. What are the, the selected categories? What, well, what are the enabled categories? So the user has clicked, so he has selected something. So now the system asks, what are the, select, the enabled categories, the one that I can use to refine my search? And what are the candidate documents based on the selected category? And you just keep asking that all the rest when you, you know, you select another category, all the rest is powered by the logic of the, the owl. In this case, the owl logic. This is a smart pre-processing based on knowledge. Yeah, it means that you, the pre-processing is expressing the knowledge in an, a knowledge representation language. And so you shift the, this knowledge that you would express in code, let's say in Python or in JavaScript and whatever, 
you shift part of this knowledge and you put it closer. You actually put it right with the data. I think that that's probably the, the best illustration of um, data centric mindset. Hmm. I, I mean, I've heard of domain driven development where you model the construction of the software around your understanding of how that software works and you separate concerns in the code as you would separate concerns in different aspects of the apple farm mm -hmm. this uh software is focused on picking the apples so i only count and collect apples with this software this is for processing it into applesauce same software system but just different concern different module um and then the retail processing for the apple sauce sales or apples being sold as, as raw fruit i i know i'm not, i really i don't i haven't looked at domain driven development but i know it's related so i don't want to say anything wrong but i know it's usually when you speak about data centric stuff one of the dream is to have domain driven development so basically have your your website built from the data so you you would have to generate only the ui but all the logic of your system is by in the data so tell me a little bit more about this owl powered reasoning system for information retrieval oh damn that's the art part i'm trying to explain it right now um so let's start from the beginning i have you remember um, Semantic Web for the Working Ontologies, the book club with Dean Alamen? So in when, so it was a while ago, but this is the kind of idea that you see two years before and, you know, it clicks. You have the, the idea resolving right now. There is um, in one of the chapters, actually chapter 12, basic owl, is introducing an example about a questionnaire so he's presenting um reasoning patterns our reasoning patterns with the example of a questionnaire so the question is has questions and answers some questions are selected by the user and so a question if a question is selected then the question is answered and some question requires a selected and a specific answer to be enabled okay the example was a with a cable tv help desk so if the first question was is the problem with the tv or the cable i don't remember exactly then if it selects the tv then another set of question is available if you select the cable, then it's uh, so you, you see the. You're writing. Is, you're writing a chain of of po possible scenarios. Yeah, so I think you can already see the the similarity with the classification search, mm -hmm. search into a classification. So what I basically did is okay. I understand the reasoning pattern you describe in there, and I'm just applying that to classification search. And what I did is kind of chaining this pattern and I'm trying to enhance it right now. And so it ends up in an ontology that I call the information retrieval ontology. And it, it means that this is, um, I would say a top level ontology, a core ontology. So it's very generic, but then you plug in your own ontology. So, and by, by your own ontology, I mean, usually in a company, you have a way to classify stuff. Whether, see, if I take the example of my company, on the website, Trespass, hmm. every client, they bring their own classification. If you're looking in the Schneider Electric catalog, then Schneider Electric has its own classification. You know, they have their own way of classifying, classifying their product. So I don't remember, but there is maybe a, more than a thousand um, data providers, so so companies. So it means that you have probably 
more than a thousand different ways to classify potentially the same things. And the goal is, okay, they have categories. They have trees, so it's essentially a bunch of trees. Mm -hmm. And I wanna integrate that into a system so I can leverage those trees. So what I do is I take those trees, I plug that into the, uh, the information retrieval ontology. The information retrieval ontology contains the logic. And then since when it's plugged in, then all the category search that I described, so meaning if you select the category, then the subcategories should be available, but also the related categories should be available. If I have got those, selected category, then those documents are the candidate document. All this logic is just in a little little ontology that you put at the top, and it brings all the, the, the logical power to your entire system. So you have a bunch of trees, a bunch uh -huh. of trees that have uh, any level of, of height or width, any varying level of complexity. It's just randomly generated according to the catalog or the capabilities of each manufacturing mm -hmm. company. Um, and what you're doing is you're nesting this logical Christmas Christmas tree star on top of it that allows it to scan and sort of feed back the, the logic or the structure or categories. So you can map it out with all the other Christmas stars to all the whatever is sitting on the other trees um it helps make sense of uh the underlying complexity underneath and and find some let, way to reconcile them or okay let, let me try again the explanation um i made a notebook of this so you can play with it and understand it it's way clearer like that but okay my assumption is that as a company you have a way of classifying stuff. So you have a classification, maybe multiple classifications. And you might even have transversal link between those classification. Okay, something like if I've got a, um, a classification of functions, maybe one of the functions imply that there is a shape and I've got a classification of shapes, Th those kind of stuff. So it means that you don't, it's not only hierarchical. You can have an arbitrary graph, mm. actually. Okay. Well, the only thing is this graph doesn't have loop. It's a directed graph. So you can imagine that as a bunch of trees with ropes between the, tree, the trees. Okay. Mm. A branch in a tree is linked to another tree, another branch of another tree. Right, because it's related like concepts between those trees. That tree might be talking about nuts and bolts, and then that other tree would be talking about nuts and bolts, but you're going to have a relationship between the branch yeah. that talks about nuts from both, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. And so, so I'm assuming your company already has that. So there is no work to do, to be done there. It's yeah, just okay. there. It's clean. But you want to leverage that in a search process. You want to search your document. For many years, you already have classified your documents in many different ways. So you organize them. And you want to you wanna integrate that into a system that will let you search through those documents. And you could do a piece of code to do that. I mean, you can always write a piece of code to do that. Mm -hmm. But my goal here is that, okay, your, your, your set of categories, your trees, that's my data graph, okay? And I'm gonna plug this data graph into my domain graph, that is the, my ontology, the information retrieval ontology. So I've got a mapping and I'm saying, okay, all those categories, it's the same thing as my concept of category in my information retrieval ontology. So when you make that link, you you can start leveraging the the logic that is in the information retrieval ontology. 
and you also mentioned, okay, in all my data graph, those nodes, those are the document I'm looking for. So those document, they are, they are the same thing as the class document in my information beautiful ontology. So you create links between the, the ontology that contains the logic and your data graph. So you end up actually in a Twitter graph. So there's a, there's a tree and you adorn the tree with something on the top that allows you to scan and make sense of the complexity of the branches, the height, all that, right? Like whether it's tall, wide, whatever, mm. shape doesn't matter. And then you have a bunch of trees that have this adornment mm -hmm. and that plugs into the thing that is allowing you to share intent with what you're looking for, right? Because otherwise mm -hmm. you'd have a really hard time You'd have to look at each tree, each branch, each data point to get the thing that you want. This is reducing the pre-processing it by creating an interface of information of concepts. Yep. It means cool. that once you have that, you could have done all of this with a piece of code. Sounds painful. Yeah, I, I haven't tried, but I think it's it's painful. But the, the point is afterwards when you want to build because you want to build a, a software on top of that, you still need a, a bit of code. But your code is much simpler because the question, your, your code is going to interact with the database. And instead of saying, hey, give me all the categories that are related to this. And if this is selected, then you cannot give me that, but you can give, you know, if you, instead of encoding everything in the code, the code should just say, okay, Here's the search. Now there is a reasoning process that goes on. And after, so here's the search. Okay, get me the candidate document. Get me the, the, the enable categories. That's it. Two queries, actually three, because you got to insert the search. But then your search process on, on the front end side, it's powered by only two, que two queries that are in the logic code. All the rest, it's done via via reasoning. That's the goal. And of course, it's, it has limitation. It's a toy example. Right. But don't but, believe that it, it will work in production. It's a research example. Yeah, so, but the idea serves to be a, a pretty cool concept, you know, that would heavily reduce um, a marketplace, a federation of, of service providers, data providers. The mm -hmm. idea holds a lot of merit. Um, Why well, I hope. I and hope. and what are the what are the benefits of being able to expose the concepts or knowledge amongst all these trees? I mean, it would save you the the trouble of having to model each tree from the perspective of the platform, right? Yeah, the the trees are already modeled. Right, but I'm saying like to integrate it somewhere. Wouldn't somebody have previously had to? find some way to hook it in to the overlapping to the base of it, to, to the nucleus? Wouldn't there have been some sort of integration work? Yeah, or definitely. Yeah, yeah, there, there would have been. There is still some integration work, but there will always be some, some sort of integration work. The goal is to make it as minimum as possible. And right now it's, I made an example with the pizza ontology. And it shows that you, you, it's just adding a few subclass of link. And it's, and you can actually automate all everything with Sparkle queries. It's also the, the beauty of uh, RDF and Sparkle is that since both the, the model, so the domain graph and the data graph, they are both in RDF. You can write Sparkle queries that spans over both. So, but uh, yeah, the, the, I cannot explain that. Well, I cannot yet explain that with just words. I need to show stuff. Yeah, these are very abstract notions that kind of need some sort of visual artifact to make it palatable. I feel like we're skating in the mm -hmm. air with uh, some of these ideas. Um, Cool, man. But it, I, I, if the point is, 
there is a lot of knowledge in your code. You could put that into your database close to the data. So it makes your code simpler and it makes your data smarter. That's the trendy way of saying it. That's Let's cool. Say. That's sexy. That sounds good. Um, where do you hope to apply this harder knowledge, skills, and experience? Like once you're done with your PhD, what do you what are you thinking of doing? I'm gonna move to. I've got another project where I, I'm gonna join another company. Um, the well, thing we with the PhD. Yeah. We, oh, go ahead. Sorry. The, the, during the PhD, you learn many things that are not only technical, like you learn how to tackle a problem, uh, even though you don't know if it's solvable or not, you know how to, you learn how to drive, you know, drive yourself through the, the mess and, you know, go step by step. But in a PhD, nobody gives you the step. You get them build up your step and then climb your step. So, this, you can apply it everywhere. And the thing that I like is really this bridge between the, the domain expert that has, that understand nothing about the, the computer science stuff and being able to make the translation between the human knowledge and the representation that the computer can use. That's what I'm, I'm gonna try to apply. Find a domain. I know I've learned the tool. That's what I've done. Now I need to find a domain to apply it or many different domains to apply the tool. Because I believe the tool is very powerful. And we're kind of seeing that right now in the, you know, with those um, large language models. A lot of people are saying, hey, we need to incorporate the capabilities of those large language model with knowledge graph because we need both. We need the structured knowledge, but we also need the large language model. So how to make it them work together. I really appreciate that you're in that, uh, in the space of applied research. Um, being in that space of applied research is, uh, exposes you to the best of both worlds that you get to see what are real problems out in the world. And you get to see the pain behind the actors that are experiencing that mm -hmm. those problems. And then you have the, the task, the challenge, the the reward of being able to tackle that and try to break it down and, and make it um, solvable. Even if you can't readily 100% get over that hurdle, you might be able to chip towards a solution that, that will yield the benefit to, to, to those people experiencing that problem. And, yep. and, and it's agnostic of any sort of direct application. So... As you said, you, you're going to look for any kind of domain that would benefit from that experience. Yeah, and, and the out of that is actually communication. I mean, you, you need to know how to communicate with human, but also with the machine. And that's, a, that's probably the most hardest part. You know, it's been quite, it's been like more than 50 minutes right now. And I'm trying to communicate ideas I've been working on for a few years. And I don't think I, I managed to completely do that. But communication is key. So in every aspect of work, life, whatever, communication is always key. What, what are some of the more important communication skills or stakeholder management skills that you've developed over your PhD journey? Um, so when you're doing a PhD, you're, you're diving in a very specific subject. There is a good chance that you're one of the, one of the, if you're not the only one, you're like one of the three or four people in the world that is doing this, exactly what you're doing. It's so, so specific. So you're constantly forced to abstract and find ways to explain what you're doing so that people can help you. So you learn to uh, explain what you're doing in so many different ways and to also adapt to your public. When you're speaking to your fellow researchers, you're not gonna use the same language than if you're speaking to your 
I don't know, to your family that has that doesn't know anything about what you're doing. So, and often you also have to define, there is a, a contest in PhD. I, I think that must, that this must exist in the US also. We call that the, it's kind of the elevator pitch for uh, PhD. Okay, so the, the way is you have three minutes and you gotta make people understand what is the goal of your PhD, what is your PhD about. I saw one that was really good. Um, I think it was a chemist and he was doing a dance video, a music video. Um, okay. He explained his thesis, but he had like a like a pop song, like maybe Katy Perry uh, type beats. Uh, is that what you're talking about? It, it's exactly that. You, you. Well, I mean, I wouldn't dance and I wouldn't <laughs> use Katy Perry for to present my PhD. But the idea is exactly that. You know, there is also a lot of videos on the internet about um, they take an expert and they ask them to explain the subject to a four year or four years old in high school and and you know and so on. So it gets into complexity. That's, That's the kind of stuff you learn um, when doing a PhD. And and it's always interesting because the questions you're gonna get from the four years old and the question you're gonna get from the, the the fellow expert are always different. And it gives you, even the question from the four years old gives you a lot of insight because they, they make you, you know, they always ask weird questions that make you change your point of view on your own work. I, so, I I have a lot of respect for people that that choose willingly to pursue a PhD because uh, you're you're breaking the barrier, you're 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 traversing in the dark space of human knowledge, that's never been uh, touched upon, and you're arguing for one idea that's going to make us richer, that's going to make us have a better society. Uh, well, I, I don't I don't know if it's going to make us richer or or have a better society, but. Uh, I can search for parts. I think it's going to be useful. Yeah, I, I hope so. That's in both in Spanish and English. So one day, one day. What we, we we always say that we what's the expression? We build up on the shoulder of giants. It's something, something like this. Like this. That's exactly what you're doing when you do research. You do a state of the art. So you're looking at what everybody has done, and you're going to try to build. Sometimes you, I think you you're probably redoing something already existing, but you bring your own perspective because you can do exactly the same thing in a completely different way. And that's something new, so. But the, the main skill you learn is working in the dark, basically. That's what you do. Finding your way in the dark. That's what you do in a PhD, that's it. Do you have any advice for uh, potential PhDs, people in their masters? Anything that you'd like to share with them so that they have uh, even a flashlight in the dark or a candle? Don't be too hard on yourself. That, that, my, my understanding is, you know, we, all, we say that uh, PhD students, they often end up uh, in depression. You know, they, get, they work too hard, they get too tired. My belief is you're the only expert in what you're doing. You're the only one that is working every day, every hours on the same on this subject. So you you you're the you're the only expert of the on this domain. So everyone making you work harder, they just want to push you, and they push you because you you show that you they can push you. So the the the. The stress, it's you putting stress on yourself. That's mm -hmm. what drives you nuts. Anyway, just trust in yourself and go on. You'll see. Wonderful. Okay. Well, um, we're 40 seconds away from closing the chat. Uh, anybody in the audience, if you have any questions, less minute thoughts, they're more than welcome. Otherwise, um, Matias, it's been lovely chatting with you, and uh, happy holidays. Send me some wine, please. Oh, uh, yeah. Send I me mean, wine, I'll, I'll send you a hamburger uh, in America. No, no. <laughs>
I won't send you wine. You will come to get it. Ah, okay. That's better. <laughs> okay. Okay, bye. Have a great Christmas bye. holiday and Happy New Year.